of 19th century photographic processes since 1984 and uses a variety of cameras. Greg holds a master's degree in technology education from Cal State Long Beach, specializing in photography, graphic arts, computer software applications, and technical writing. He is an adjunct professor in historical photographic processes and other topics related to photography at Cypress College and Mount San Antonio College. In addition, Greg has been involved in conservation work for the National Park Service in Death Valley, has lectured on the history of photography and related processes, fine art processes, and printing processes at the Los Angeles and New York International Art Expositions and also in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Greg. I also want to introduce my white lamb who's back in the back there. Yes. So, uh, once again, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, it's uh, I met Rebecca when we first moved out to Mechiel about six years ago, and we uh, kind of changed uh, cross paths several times. Uh, most recently, um, I'm helping the Historical Society here do some uh, background research into some of the old vineyards that are here that date back more than 50 years. So those of you who know what's going on on there. And uh, well, our biggest stumble here is trying to get a 18-week course, which is typically now taught in 16 weeks, to you in less than an hour. So I, I do get that teacher tone to my voice really quickly. Um, Lanny just ignores it, um, but that, that will, and we're going to be going really, really quick. So I, I appreciate your patience with this. Um, because of the time constraints also, what we'll do is if, if, if you would like to have some questions, let's wait maybe until after, unless it's a burning question that I can get a real quick answer to. Otherwise, um, a 20-minute answer is not going to help anybody. So, okay. And once again, a reminder for those who might have just joined us, I'll be handing out original artifacts. These are original photographic processes. Uh, they are fragile. They are most of them are one of a kind. Um, they're the the physical thing that was in the camera. So I am one generation away from whoever or whatever is in that that particular photograph. So um, if it's in a plastic container or wrapper, please don't take it out of that. Um, there will be maybe a, a time or two where I'll, I'll pass out something where you can actually kind of feel it. Just use the, the fingers that you weren't e eating the cookies with, if you don't mind, please. Okay. Um, I got into the old processes many years ago when I was doing the LA and New York Art Expos. Uh, a close friend of mine who, who uh, has since passed away was working in what's called mesotint, uh, similar to aquatint, only a whole lot more difficult. And the mesotint process, I knew I couldn't do it because it's a very uh, laborious process. And I was trying to figure out a way to do it photomechanically because at that time I was studying photography. Um, I eventually found out that there was one process called photogravure, which is very similar to it. And that was the first process I learned. Now, in typical fashion for me, now with the hindsight of 30 some odd or close to 40 years, I now know photogravure is one of the most difficult processes to do, and you don't know until the end of the third day that you screwed up on the first day. So that's where I started with all of this. The, the, and everybody has the brochure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So uh, feel free to go along with that. Um, the problem that we had in the beginning is they, they understood the optics of how a camera worked. Matter of fact, the earliest form of a camera was called a camera obscura. We could take, during the daylight, lock out all the, the um, windows and the doors here and put a small quarter-sized uh, hole in, in one of the, the black plastic or whatever it is that's covering the walls. And you would see projected on the other side of the room, upside down and backwards, a view of what was going on on the outside. I uh, used to have a, a, a piece of property in Westminster. I could never figure out where the hole in the garage was. But if I would go out in the garage at the right time of the day, I could see my car in the driveway projected on the inside of the garage. The problem they had in working with this is they, they could not capture the image with something that we now call photosensitive. And if they were able to capture it, they could not stabilize that image. And it would just continue to get darker and darker and darker. There was a gentleman named Neeps 
um, who was out of France that was working with the very first process, the very first camera uh, photographic image that we know of was done by him. It's at the uh, University of Texas in Austin. Um, I've actually seen that one when I was through Texas one time. I made a point to go see it. Very small image. Um, it was not uh, very practical. The exposure was eight hours long. Uh, Neeps eventually got in contact with Louis Daguerre. Daguerre was a, uh, Neeps was kind of a, a scientist. Daguerre was a showman. He was the inventor of the diorama. Some of you may be familiar with dioramas that they have in uh, libraries and, and sometimes museums where you've got a painting on a wall and there's, there's objects and things half coming out of the wall and then things in the front wall. He's the one that came up with that. He and Neeps got together. Uh, in typical fashion, though, they, neither one of them wanted to tell the other person exactly what they knew and what they didn't know. But uh, eventually, they formed a partnership. Uh, Daguerre was more of the showman. And Neeps eventually dies. Daguerre continues the work. They were working on a copper plate that was electroplated or layered with silver. And you would put that in a what was called a fuming box. And what you have, let's flip on the first page here, on the inside, positive process right here, the garyotype. And it would go in this fuming box with uh, iodine crystals in there. And those iodine crystals would then form a photosensitive material in there. And as the story goes, Daguerre went one day and made an exposure, knew that he wouldn't have time to finish it. He took and put the, the, the exposed plate in a cupboard. And then the next day when he came in and was going to work on it, lo and behold, the image was stabilized. Great. I've solved the problem. What did I do? So to his credit in the scientific method, he actually started taking out things from the cupboard and eventually found out there was a broken thermometer in there. And it was the mercury in that thermometer which was able to stabilize these uh, images on, or on a copper plate. Mm -hmm. We'll pass uh, two sets of these around. My lovely wife will pick up one set. And Rebecca, if you could just put them in a chair. This is kind of a tarnished one and one that looks pretty nice. And you very typically, you can look on the back, you can see this is copper. Okay? And if you look at the shiny ones, some of the, uh, a lot of times they have a, a little edge around there where it looks tarnished. Some of them were toned in what's called gold chloride. And if the image looks uh, very, very stable and shiny and pretty and new, it probably was toned in gold chloride. There is a ways of, um, and I've done it, um, I've got a whole stack of them to do one of these days when I have the time. But the ones that are in pretty bad shape, there are non-destructive ways of actually getting rid of that tarnish, and uh, I, the ones I've done, it, it makes them look just like they were brand new and just came out of the camera. Just remember, this is the physical thing that was in the camera, so I am one generation away from whoever that is. Um, early exposures range from 5 to 70 minutes, so it's obvious, too, that these typically weren't uh, processes and, and exposures. It was also an expensive process. Um, how many of you know somebody who has a full-size um, life-size oil painting of themselves in their house. Yeah, I don't know either. Okay, I, you know. Um, people back then who would have that sort of thing are the type of people who would afford to have a daguerreotype done. It was not for the common people. And if you wanted two copies, you had to sit through two exposures. The other downside to this, um, Alice in Wonderland, remember that? The Cliff's Notes version of it or whatever, okay? Um, you, what was one of the characters you remember in that? Mad Hatter. Where did that come from? Mercury. Mercury poisoning, a absolutely. A occupational hazard uh, in England during this time. They were curing the beaver uh, hats, the big tall hats. The beaver pelts were being cured with mercury, and the people that were doing it eventually would get absorbed mercury. Do these camera people have a short lifetime? Yeah, quite often. Yeah, there's uh, the, the history books. Um, I teach the history of photography at Mount Sac, and it's chock full of people who, who die from exposure to a lot of this stuff. Um, when I was in Australia, there was a, a gentleman um, who was very proud of the fact and uh, that he had done traditional daguerreotypes without any precautions, and he very graphically showed me how many teeth he had lost oh from, uh, it's like, first of all, too much information, oh and, you know, I, I doubt, 
you know, how much smarts you have because this stuff was pretty nasty. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, each one, once again, was a one-of-a-kind image. Now, they often reference these as a mirror with a memory. So when you're looking at this, depending upon how you look at it, you kind of see it flips back and forth, and sometimes it looks like a mirror, and then you can see maybe a little bit of an image. That's where that mirror with a memory comes about. Um, they were, they, it's a very, very fragile image. If you, even if you have clean hands and you touch the surface, the oils, even if you just washed them, there's oils and acids that will transfer to that. They reference that as fragile as a butterfly's wing. And this is part of the reason why, generally, they are encased. There is a, a mat that goes over that, a piece of glass that goes on top of that. And quite often, they would tape it. Here's an example of one that's been taped. Uh, I think I've got another one to pass around. Uh, yeah, we'll pass just one of these around. I'll, I'll just show you. You can see that there's tape on the back. And this is another indication of what the, the, the provenance, this helps us, how many genealogists do we have in here? Okay, uh, how, how can you prove this thing happened during that time? Well, uh, the fact that it's got this tape on there that looks pretty old, um, even though this one is in remarkably good condition, it's just as shiny as it probably came out of the camera. It's absolutely gorgeous, and we'll do a close-up of the front, and then I'll flip it on the back again so that you've got that. You can see the tape that's on there. So I know that this is an original one. And that tape, they kind of tape the edge of this sandwich, as it were. And then they put this metal binding around it. And then they would put it in a case. So that's part of what also added to the expense of all that. You typically had um, a variety of different cases. Um, earlier ones were a silk or satin. Later ones might be a felt type material that would, uh, they would take a, a branding iron and heat it up and put this little image on there. I'll pass these around. Now notice these seem very lightweight. This is some inexpensive uh, balsa wood, lightweight pine that goes into constructing that. I purchased one not too long ago that had been in a fire and that the, the covering on there that looks like leather, it's not. All that is is like a paper mache. And that started to peel away due to the fire. And underneath it was a newspaper. So they might have been using newspapers to help create this paper mache sort of material on there. I have been unable to uncover enough of it to where I can find a date on the newspaper, but that's, that's the least of my issues. The, the daguerreotype process was the primary process used during this time, very expensive, fragile. Um, uh, you had to have multiple exposures in order to get multiple copies of it. At the same time, there was a gentleman out of England, William Henry Fox Talbot, and that takes us to <clears throat> the paper negative process, which is right here. Now, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as Talbot types, salted paper, Calotypes, for our purposes in here, it's all the same thing. What uh, Talbot was doing is he was taking writing paper, which typically has a harder surface on it than, than regular paper, and he would take nothing more sophisticated than gelatin material. Same thing if you buy Knox gelatin or so it's the same stuff. It's one of my favorite processes. And then you would uh, coat that gelatin uh, with some salt in it, a uh, regular table salt, coat that onto there, uh, dry it, put on a second coating of silver nitrate, and then you would expose that into the camera, and now you had a negative. It was a paper negative. And from that paper negative, you could make a lot of copies from that relatively inexpensively. There was a lot of friction between Daguerre and Talbot. Um, they had a mutual friend who evidently had talked to Talbot and assured Talbot that Daguerre was nowhere near, go ahead and take your time, Daguerre's nowhere near releasing his process. He then leaves England, goes to France, tells Daguerre, you better hurry up and release your process because Fox Talbot's almost ready. Daguerre gets the credit for the first process. And Fox Talbot, who was landed gentry, a mathematician, a scholar, um, a politician, 
his wife, uh, uh, not his wife, his mother accused him of not amounting to anything because he did not event the first photographic process. So mm -hmm. there was conflict even back then. With his process, though, can anybody uh, see somewhat of a problem with this? Paper? Paper? Now, if you hold this up to the light, this is good paper. Compliments of Mother Xerox. You hold it up to the light, you can see a little bit of a paper texture to that, that texture behind there. Well, when you make copies onto more of this photosensitive paper, it's not as sharp as it would be with this daguerreotype. So you had the daguerreotype that was expensive and fragile and it was heavy and it had to be in a case, and you had the salted paper process, which was much less expensive, but at the same time, it wasn't quite as, uh, as sharp as it was. And of course, the typical consumers, being the fussy people that they are, they said, well, I want something that's sharp and inexpensive. Enter the wet plate process. 1851, Frederick Scott Archer develops uh, a process where, and it gets its name because, first of all, you had to have a plate, a glass plate, that was the same size as your final image. There was no enlargements back then. This is roughly an 11 by 14, so it had to be taken on a camera that had a glass plate that was at least this big. And what they would do is, in a darkened room, they would take uh, some, this collodion had the viscosity of Cairo syrup or motor oil, depending upon what, what you're most familiar with. They would pour it onto the plate, they would evenly distribute it, let the excess drain back into the bottle, Take this, put it in a bath of silver nitrate until it gets a creamy color. Take it out of there, put it on a rack, let it drip dry. Take it out of there, put it on a film holder. That was the same size as your final image. Go outside the tent, go over to your camera that was already set up, put this in there, pull this out, which exposed the plate. Expose the plate. Make your exposure. Close this back, go back into the tent, and you had to process it before that emulsion, that photosensitive material, dried. Once it dried, it wasn't photosensitive anymore, hence the term wet plate. If you've ever used, um, I think it's called magic, yes? Uh, Brady used that in the store. Yep, yep, we're not there yet. Yep, we're getting there. Um, if you've ever used, I think it's called magic band-aid or liquid band-aid, yeah. the stinky stuff that's, uh, and if you've ever been around the movie industry, uh, a lot of times they still use that to create scars, because when you coat it on the skin, it kind of puckers the skin a little bit. Flexible, transparent, waterproof, it was a great material for that. <coughs> Excuse me. And these wet plate cameras, what, there was a variety of different processes that were developed using this collodion uh, process here. We also had the uh, a form of a positive. Technically, it's a it's a negative, but we think of it in terms of a positive, called an ambrotype. And I'll pass one of these around to you. Do you want a water? I've got one here. Thank oh, you, okay. Rebecca. Ambrotype is on glass. If you hold that up to the light. Hold that up to the light, you can see right through it. That's because the backing on this is starting to um, deteriorate. Earlier ones, they would put just a piece of black construction paper behind there. Later on, they thought, well, why can't they just take some paint and just paint, which is what's happening with here. They painted the back of it. And then they eventually realized, hey, I could take and put that on a colored glass, and that colored glass would accomplish the same thing. Um, I will do this with a caveat right now, that if you go to an antique store and do this, you will freak out the antique store owners. Okay, But if you have purchased one of these or you have one of these in your collection at home, let me show you how you can take the images out because sometimes you can't tell the difference between an ambrotype and a tintype, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Take the image, turn it upside down, tap it, and it typically falls right out. Sometimes, if it's really in there, you've got to tap for quite a while. But in this particular case, I then hold this up to the light, and I can see it's an amber-colored glass that's directly through there. So this would be another amber type. This one, and once again, I'll pass this around. Please don't take it out of the case, because it may, it may fall and, and crash and burn. 
Um, but this is in what's called a union case. It was not a union in reference to the North and the South. It was a union, ca a union uh, case in reference to an early form of plastic. It was a union of sawdust, shellac, um, some sort of pigment, whatever color you wanted. It was heated up, put into a mold with hinges on it, and now you had a much more durable case. This would be an upcharge for typically those things. You're formulating a question. I can see it all the way over. No, you're okay? All right. <laughs> You have a big question mark above your head. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. We also had uh, another process using this same collodion material. So collodion was used for the wet plate, it was used for the amber type, and it was also used for the tin type. Um, this is what's called a whole plate. If we flip to the front of your brochure, You'll see here it talks about the daguerreotypes and the tin types, and here's the sizes of those right here. And you'll notice it's got one that says a whole plate. A whole plate was six and a half by eight and a half. And if you had a plate that was half that big, guess what that was called? A half plate. You take half of that, a quarter plate. A half of that, you've got an eighth plate, et cetera, et cetera, until you get down to the gems. Now, this is called a tin type. What kind of metal do you think this was on? Tin. You'd be wrong. It's actually, it's actually on iron. And how do I know it's on iron? Because when you put them on a magnet, tin is not magnetic. How did it get the name tin type? Well, if you look at these carefully, you'll see that they're not really square. The, the edges are not square. It's not perpendicular. They would take tin snips and cut these down. The good news is you actually had a way. Now this was a much less expensive process, and you don't have to put these into cases. Quite often they would do that. I'll pass some of these around. You would have what's called Potters, patent, paper, holders, which is always a fun thing to say really fast. <laughs> and I'm going to pass, let's see, I've got one, one more. Oh, yeah, one, it's in type by itself. Okay. So what we have here is some of these. Here is our tin type by itself. Here is a potter's patent paper holder, earlier ones, you can edit that out later, earlier ones were printed, later ones were embossed, and we also sometimes, during the Civil War, let's go back to the Civil War now, from 1864 to 1866, photographs were taxed as a way to help pay for the Civil War. So if you see what's called a tax stamp on the back, this was not something that you would mail it. You would be paying a tax, and typically you have writing on there where they cancel the stamp when they put it on there. I'll pass these around. What I've got is a complete set. I just want to make sure you all are getting one of everything. There we go. Okay, so you can look at those. These are what's called CDVs. This size is called CDVs, carte de visites. Think in terms of an early calling card or an early business card. And people would start collections of these, and you would slip your, your famous um, politician, your uh, stage star, something like that, into the family ab album, and by association, people would think that you're related to them. These albums, there's a picture of one right here, bottom of page three. And these albums were quite the collection, various sizes. I have one that I, I never take out. It's a very heavily tooled leather. The, the cover on it is probably about 3 quarters of an inch thick um, on both the front and the back. And it has both the CDB size and some larger sizes, which we'll talk about in just a moment. This one would have had probably four to a page. We call it four up in the printing industry. Um, four up to a page, and you would have your family collection in there. 
these albums are getting harder to find, and especially harder to find when they're in good condition. I almost brought one here today, but I, I was worried about not having enough, having enough time uh, for people to look at it and, and plot through it. But a lot of times you'll see these up on uh, any of these images. The price point is starting to go up. When I started collecting this probably 40-some-odd um, oh, years ago, you could buy tin types for a dollar or two. Uh, daguerreotypes are typically more expensive. Uh, now, even uh, even on Shop Goodwill, which has a lot of these things show up, I see these albums all the time showing up, but a lot of times they're in pretty rough shape. So you can expect to pay hundreds of dollars for one that's in good condition before it has any photographs in it. A lot of times people will take those photographs out, and if there's anybody of, of any uh, notoriety in there, they can sell those individually for a whole lot more than you can for the album by itself. We also had, <clears throat> um, uh, there was another one called um, uh, Under the Tintypes. It was, uh, if we look here on page three, a brief history of the tintypes. If you have tintypes at home, if it's on a thicker metal, I've got a couple of them up here. It has uh, stamped on the edge Neff's melanotype, and as soon as I picked this one up, I noticed, boy, this is heavy. It seemed weird, and it's much heavier metal. And then come to find out, um, I've got three in the collection. I think there's a couple more floating around. And if you look carefully on the edge, you can see where it's stamped on there. And if I see that stamp for Neff's melanotype, I can be assured that it was... Uh, that particular photograph was taken from 1856 to 1860 because beyond that point they went to a thinner metal and they didn't have that stamping on there. So these are some of the tools that might help you try to evaluate um, the age of them. We also have the Civil War period, very popular for these photographs. You had photographers, tintype photographers that were literally following the troops. Not only do you have Matthew, Matthew Brady, as you pointed out earlier, with the wet plate process. And actually it was more his workers. Matthew Brady photographed the Civil War basically on speculation. And it was other people, Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, that did the work for him. There was only one battle, possibly two, that Matthew himself uh, photographed. Um, you guys are history people. Uh, Ken Burns' the Civil War? Oh, yeah. Okay, they talk about um, Matthew Brady actually lost money. He eventually became bankrupt, uh, and he could not pay for the storage fees for these wonderful glass plates that all his photographers had taken during the Civil War, and they were sold at auction, and they mentioned this in the Civil War series, that people would buy them for their greenhouses. And so these, these valuable, invaluable, they can't put a price tag on them, ended up fading away under the sun. How did Nancy Brady keep those glass plates from breaking in a wave and bouncing over hill and dale? Uh, you, you know, you just store it the best you can. There's a story of, of, of uh, Timothy O'Sullivan running around what we now know as um, uh, Yellowstone, and the mule that was carrying his finished plates crashed and burned off the side of a hill, and he had to go back to civilization, buy all new plates, and go back out. So when you complain next time because your, your cell phone camera is a little bit heavy in your pocket, it could be worse. Um, <laughs> here's as bad as it gets. This is a photograph. This is uh, the largest camera of all built in 1900. It was called the Mammoth. And uh, I tried to build one of these. The wife wouldn't let me. Um, I don't understand why not. A uh, camera weighed four, 1,400 pounds when loaded with its 500-pound glass plate holder. Oh, wow. It was four and a half by eight feet was the size of the negative. It was uh, designed for um, a railroad company that wanted to have a single perfectly detailed portrait of their new luxury train. Wow. It uh, operated by a team of up to 15 men. So you think you've got problems. <laughs> so, yeah. And did it work? Yeah. No, I haven't seen any images from it, but uh, supposedly they're around somewhere. But these glass plates, um, the, I, when I got into this nonsense, eventually I wrote a four-level class at uh, one of the colleges. 
in which the photogravure was the last process that you did, as we mentioned earlier, and you had to take, you know, class one before you could take class two, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my students decided he wanted to do a wet plate process. And I go, okay, Glenn, knock yourself out. It took him two semesters wow. to get one glass plate, and he broke it within two weeks. Oh. So, yeah. So yeah, that, was, that was part of the pitfalls. As a matter of fact, some of the, uh, one of Alexander Gardner's famous photograph of Lincoln has a crack in it. Supposedly at the exact same spot where the where it cracks across his head was where he was shot. And, you know, all sorts of interesting things like that. When you're looking at your tintypes, depending upon uh, the size of them, whether they're in the Potter's Patent Paper Holders. Are you with me? Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, there was a brown period where it was kind of a chocolate color, a lot of rustic props, um, uh, wooden fencing, uh, tree stumps, bales of hay, these sorts of things. And then you had the gem period as they start getting smaller and smaller. They actually had... Me. They actually had cameras that had multiple lenses. So you could actually take a whole plate, put it in the, put it in the camera, and, and the, the greatest number I've ever seen was 16. 16 lenses to there. So you could make one exposure, get 16 little pictures, and then send it to the guy in the back for processing. He's cutting them out with his tint snips. You put it in the potter's patent paper holders. And then your, your, your cost to produce these is a whole lot less. It isn't by accident that the peak period of your uh, tintypes was 1860 to 1863. Does that, those dates ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, Civil War. Yeah. So they were going back and forth. And some of them during this time period are folded in half because they, they might send the bigger ones through the mail. And they would fold it in half so it fit in the envelope. Yes. What spurred Michael Brady to be the photographer in the Civil War? Uh, he, he was doing it because he wanted to record it, but basically he was doing it because he could, thought he could make some money out of it. Yeah, he was, he had already, he learned actually the daguerreotype process from uh, Samuel Morris, as in Morse code, who happened to be in France when Daguerre made his announcement. Morris learned it from Daguerre, came to the United States, Brady learned it from him, and Brady became very good at doing daguerreotypes. He was photographing all the politicians in Washington. He had a huge gallery in Washington, D.C. And a matter of fact, he at some point in time snagged, I think it was a Senate chair, and everybody who wanted to be a politician wanted to be photographed sitting or standing next to that Senate chair. So it was a big deal for him. But uh, he, he did not anticipate the Civil War lasting this long. He also did not anticipate that by the time it was done, pretty much everybody knew somebody who was dead or maimed or any of a number of things. And the last thing they wanted to see was photographs of dead and dying people. Now, this is where it differed from um, Roger Fenton, who photographed the Crimean War during that period, because he was photographing the Crimean War as an idyllic sort of what you do for the country, you didn't see the bloated bodies, the, the dead horses, the carnage, the, the things that are associated with war. But by the time the Civil War came around, Matthew Brady wanted this graphic realization of what war was like, and people didn't want to see it, frankly. And so all this time and effort and money that he spent and all these photographers he hired, plus when he produced these, he took credit for the photographs, and he got a lot of heat for that. But it's intellectual property. He paid for it. He paid them. They were employees of his. So you know, as far as you want to, if you want to look at that, he should have. Alexander Gardner and Timothy O'Sullivan eventually broke away from him. Alexander Gardner was the one who photographed the Lincoln conspirators, and also was the only one who was allowed to photograph the hanging of the conspirators. And Alexander Gardner, when he published a two-volume set called. Um, a photographic record of the Civil War or some variation of that theme. Um, he gave credit to the photographers who actually took the images. Did yeah. they have one, one Wait, more? No, hang on. Ladies first. Um, Brady, uh, Gardner's pictures of the hanging of the assassination yep. quite a ways away. Yeah. Those pictures are so clear you can see. Yep. Try, well, absolutely. Well, he had a, he had a big uh, wet plate camera. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And it was a big negative. So when you see prints from this, remember, they did not have enlargers back then. Um, Rebecca, where are you at? You gave me this little negative today to make a print of it. I put it in a larger, I make a big print however I want to make it. You didn't do that. You wanted, you wanted a big print like this. You had to have a camera that took a negative that was this big. And so therefore the quality of that, which is why I still run around with an 8x10 and, and sometimes larger cameras, because um, yes, I know I can do it digitally, I understand, but it's it, I'm the purest in that sense. Yeah. Uh, was there more than one camera at the execution of the conspirators? No, he was the only one. He was the only one allowed to photograph it. Now, was there another one? Did somebody sneak one in? Possibly, but not that I'm aware. Well, no, because there's pictures of the before yep. and then pictures of after. I yep. thought there wouldn't be enough time for the before exposure. Well, no, those are, by, the, by this time the exposures have gotten down. They weren't 70 minutes long. No, no, thank you for clarifying okay. that. By the time you get to wet plates, we are now entering the era where you might have a couple seconds. If something was moving, and by the way, sometimes when you look at these um, um, uh, uh, amber types and the tin types, and you see people standing ramrod straight, and if you look very carefully behind them, you see a little thing between their feet. Well, what they had was what was called a neck brace, and it was, it was they called it a Brady uh, brace, but near as we can figure out, Brady had nothing to do with it. But you literally, it was adjustable, and it had a little thing that you could sit back, you could rest your head into it. It was kind of a headrest. And a lot of times when you look at these old pictures, you can see that in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then the pictures before, there's people moving. Yeah. That would have blurred the picture. But the pictures, as I recall, of that scene, you didn't see a lot of blurring. Well, it all depends upon who's moving. You know, if you, um, some of my, my favorite photographs are of uh, uh, Yosemite. And uh, I was also uh, taking a lot of photographs over in one of the um, parliamentary buildings over in Europe, over in Germany. People all over the place, but there's no people in my photograph. Because my exposure is such to where the people, it might be a 10 minute exposure. As long as you're moving, you're not going to be in there. But in those photographs, he might have had an exposure a tenth of a second, a half a second. So if it wasn't moving that much, mm -hmm. it wouldn't show. But when you look closely at those now with different eyes, start looking and see, are there some, are the horses moving? Are there people that look like they're moving? The people that were unfortunately hanged, once they stopped, they weren't moving at all. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not making a joke of a, a terrible thing, but you, you get my point. And this is, a lot of these photographs during this time, if you see something of a young child and they're not moving, it's probably a post-mortem. Okay, because... How many of you have kids? <laughs> All of our kids have feather or fur, but you know, trying to get a, 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 a two-year-old to sit still for two seconds isn't going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times you see blinking eyes and things like that. Yes. How did they get the pictures of these little kids you're passing around? Well, by then it may have gotten to the point. Remember, we had the, the head braces. You very seldom see people in, in a lot of these early photographs. A lot of times they're doing something like this. They're leaning against something, okay, or they're, they've got their chin in their hand or something. It's something to help stabilize that. Start looking at some of these photographs and see. Eventually we get to the point in time where we have this page right here, about halfway down under miscellaneous. Rebecca, how are we doing for time? Okay, perfect. <coughs> Um, look under 1870s. Instantaneous exposures, approximately one tenth of a second. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but this is a camera from the, roughly the turn of the century. This is a brownie uh, camera form, brownie camera. And the reason I want to point this out to you: if you have one of these sitting at home, you may say, "How do I get it open?" A lot of times, there's a recessed button somewhere. And in this particular case, it's at the top. I press that, this comes open. I pull this out. And this has three exposures. It has uh, T for time, B for bulb, and I for instantaneous. T for time is when you press it, you can release it, you can walk away, you can come back an hour later, you press it again, 
and the shutter closes. B for bulb comes from a, literally a, what was called a, a pneumatic bulb. You had a rubber hose and a, and a bulb you'd squeeze, and as long as you squeezed it, it would stay open, and as soon as you released it, it would close. That's where the B on your, if you have a digital SLR, that's where your B comes from. I was instantaneous, listen carefully. It's a tenth of a second, give or take. So this camera is about a little bit over 100 years old. I think it was 1913. Um, it takes a film. <coughs> Did it have S-Box on it too? Uh, yeah, it's got um, five. Goes all the way to F one uh, one twenty eight. Goes to F one twenty. The reason being is because this is the size of the negative. And if you had a thirty five millimeter camera, your thirty five millimeter cameras don't have F one twenty eight. But uh, this is the size of the film. Typically, if you have these cameras, you can still buy the film. People, it can be expensive. It might run you fifty bucks a roll, but you can still find people who. The hard part is finding the spindles. Because if the spindle's not in there, quite often you'll pay more for the spindle than you will for the whole camera. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what we had also from these um, glass plates, and we're on the bottom side of page two, is we had albumin prints. Albumin comes from egg whites, and the albumin prints are very thin. This is one, well, I'll pass this around. And if you just haven't been able to resist, now's your chance. Just touch maybe the upper corner, okay, if you want. And the albumin prints have quite often this yellowish, brownish, in some cases purplish tint to them. Quite often, like this one, the yellow is obvious. And if you compare that color to this color, what do you see that's different? Yellow. This is yellow. Well, what does this look like? Purple, thank you very much. <laughs> well, wait a minute, I've got the wrong one out there. Purple. Uh, albumin print that's purple was toned in gold chloride as a way to help preserve it. And in the beginning, they didn't care whether this was going to last. They were just trying to get the work out. And your albumin prints are typically mounted on the cardboard. And what we have found is they we, we have a term in photography called fixing. It's a sodium thiosulfate is the material that she used that stabilizes it. If it was not fixed, or as we said in Indiana, washed properly, <laughs> it would start yellow. It would start yellow and fade. What they found is if they toned it in gold chloride, if it wasn't properly fixed and washed, and you put it in the gold chloride, it would get this mottled surface to it. So they inadvertently had to do archive, more, a more of an archival processing in order to get the, uh, the gold toner to, to look good on there rather than have it look like a mess. So quite often these albumin prints, and you see them in a variety of different sizes. This is roughly an 11 by 14. You also had what we uh, generically refer to as cabinet cards. And I'll pass around some of these cabinet cards um, this is on your brochure, cabinet cards, bottom right here, and if you flip over to the next page, right here underneath the postage stamps, is everybody with me? Okay. It talks about the cabinet cards and the, the card colors and the borders and how the corners were treated is all an indication roughly of the age. Um, I gave this talk to the Orange County Genealogical Society one time, and the, the, the president was just hammering me on, well, I need, she's used to dealing with wills and deeds of trust and birth certificates. I need to know exactly when this photograph, it's not going to happen, unless it has a date written on it. 
and that information is always suspect. But unless it has that date written on it, you're good if you can guess plus or minus five years. You can't, you can't judge it. Well, can't you tell by um, fashion? No, because am I in San Francisco and New York? Yeah. Or am I in the, the little town of 5,000 people that I grew up with in, Indi in Indiana? Fashion doesn't hit down there at the same rate it does. You can't tell by hairstyles. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we take a picture of all of us right now, and 100 years ago, try to date the photograph by everybody's hairstyle. It's not going to happen. Okay. So, these cabinet cards, and I'll send out um, a couple different versions. I'll send out, oops, I thought I had one. Um, one where it's starting to go yellow, and I'll also give it to you with one that's purple, so you can see the difference. Uh, let me do it this way. And I'll also send it out with a, another form of these cards. This is called platinum printing. And this is a subtle thing. You'll notice when you look at these that it's, it's not that yellowish. It's a little bit more neutral. It's kind of looking like a typical silver gelatin black and white print that we all in this group probably are familiar with. But when you're looking at these, I'll get them you can see that there's a difference between the yellow ones that are fading, the ones that are toned in gold chloride, and then the platinum ones. And of course the platinum ones, all of these, when you look at it, remember, your negative was 5 by 7 inches. It was a 5 by 7. So there's no enlargement. So when you look at this, you can see the detail on it. It's absolutely gorgeous detail. Um, one of the ones that's going around, um, is part of this set, and this is Uncle Sam and Aunt Margaret Chapman. And the beauty of this is we have one where, unfortunately, somebody beveled the corners, so I don't know what the corners were originally looked like, but I'm going to guess it's the oldest one. And then we have another one that's kind of got a plain border, and then we have another one where it's a fancy border. The fancier the border, the more information, especially if it's embossed on the photographer and all this stuff, generally the later in the period it is, the newer that it is. The beauty of this and looking at these is when you look at this, especially when you look at her, on this one, which is probably the newest, she looks younger here than she did here. And what I think they did is they went in and they retouched the negative. They helped get rid of some of those wrinkles that we all have. Okay. <laughs> And, and, it, and if you, um, when you look at this, when you look at it, she looks like she's got an orange peel texture to her skin. Um, I have in my collection a, a bunch of glass plates that are that size. And when you look at them carefully, when you flip it to the side that had the photosensitive material, you can see where somebody went in with the pencil. In some cases, they're adding density to get rid of the wrinkles. And other areas, of, I've got one where somebody they made his mustache bigger by scraping it away a little bit <laughs> so that he could make her look at a bush or mustache. Um, we also had, <clears throat> yeah, the four, there, was a, there was a time before Photoshop. We also had in the 1840s a way to proof these. This is why the term proof gets kind of a, a, a bad rap. Um, they would use the cyanotype process, cyan being a, a form of blue, and the cyanotype process was invented by Sir John Herschel in the 1840s as a way to make copies of his scientific notes. These guys are smart. These are smart guys. <coughs> Excuse me. Was that the astronomer? Yeah. Yep. Sir John Herschel. Sir John Herschel gave us the term fixer. He's the one that figured out that sodium thiosulfate was the, was the hot ticket. Uh, they also refer to it as hypo sometimes. So sometimes when you look at the books, they talk about hypo. Uh, he also gave us the term negative and positive, and he coined the term snapshot. So you've got the, the younger generation running around with their smartphones taking snapshots. Oh, they can thank, uh, you know, Herschel. Okay. So a lot of times you had amateurs. By now, we've gone from the inventors to the professionals with the wet plate to now anybody can kind of do this stuff. 
And the, the proofing method, cyanotype is the easiest process. I wish I would have started with that process when I started digging into it. And by the way, when I started digging into this, there was a time before the internet, for those of you who don't know that. <laughs> uh, and you're hitting the stacks at the library, pulling out books that hadn't seen the light of day in some cases a hundred years, trying to make sense of this archaic language. But the cyanotype was also the precursor to architectural blueprinting, also the precursor to that cyan toner that's in your color printer at home. And it was a way to where you, you took that negative, you slapped it onto some of the cyanotype material, went out, exposed it to sun for a couple minutes, came in and stuck it under water, and it, it processed in a matter of a couple of minutes. You probably showed it still wet to your customer and said, is that the one you want? And they go, yep. Yeah. So, okay, then you went back and you made your albumin prints from that. So it was an early way for people to see what the images look like. Yeah, yeah, blueprint. Yeah, you can thank Sir John Herschel for that. Thank you for what you're doing. We also had uh, the development of what we call stereo cards or stereo views. And what you had was a camera. I hope some of you aren't don't have weak stomachs because one of these is a little bit on the morbid side. Um, you had photographs that were taken with a camera that had two lenses that are about four inches apart. And guess what? That's about how your eyes are apart, about four inches. That's why we see 3D. So this was an early form of 3D. I love this one. It's not in the best of shape. This is an albumin stereo view of Sing Sing Prison's kitchen. So not only is it something that if I were doing research, I could find all sorts of stuff about it, but guess what? It's got a tax stamp on the back. So in addition to having a description, and it was taken by, published by E and H T Anthony, which was a purveyor of photographic material during this time, and they were making a lot of money by selling these. You might not be able to, well, you might end up in Sing Sing. But you might not want to go to Sing Sing because you couldn't afford to, but you could afford to buy a stereo view of some of these places and go see that place by the stereo view. A lot of times when you look at the cards and you go, oh gosh, this got bent. It must have got in moisture. No, what they found is later on, this is silver gelatin. This is a, that neutral gray. What they found is that the card was slightly bent it increased that 3D effect to it because you had this little handheld, I could not find my stereo viewer, but you've probably all seen the little wooden thing. You put this in there. My face is too fat. I can never get my face in those little tiny little screens. But you had that viewer, and when it was bent like this, that increased that three-dimensional quality to there. You also had... Um, let me see if I'm missing anything. Uh, carte de visite, stereo cards, uh, cases. We talk. Oh, there. Sometimes you hear the term uh, safety film. If you've got any old, who has the pictures, of the old negatives? Somebody brought in a, a, a three-ring binder with old. Yeah, yeah. When you look on the if, next time you're digging through the negatives, see if any of them say safety film on there, because anything prior to um, the 1923 or so, about the middle of this page, uh, was of a material that, and this is what Ted Turner was doing when he was restoring all of the old films, the movies. Those were all on this cellulose nitrate based material, and that is flammable. And it's not a matter of if it's going to deteriorate, it's a matter of when. And that material, once it catches fire, and you take the light source, the match source away, it will continue burning. Safety film, when you take a small sliver of it, and usually it says safety film, so you don't have to do this. You take a small sliver of it, put a match to it, take the match away. As soon as you take the match away, the film it, it extinguishes itself somehow. It's magic. Um, we also had um, negatives onto cellulose. This cellulose material is what gave us an early Brownie camera. George Eastman, as the story goes, goes to um, uh, doing the grand tour of Europe, as I understand it, had one of those wet plate outfits in his luggage. Now, the, this wet plate material, this collodion, was ether, alcohol, and gun cotton. 
some pretty nasty smelling stuff. Well, he gets over to Europe, come to find out the bottles broke in his luggage. So he comes back to America and goes, there's got to be a better way to do this. He buys into a gentleman named Maddox, had developed a dry plate. But the problem with the dry plate is it was not as photosensitive as the wet plate. But now you started getting an amateur market that was coming in, and they would sell these traveler's kits where you'd buy, have this little satchel, and it would have a camera, a bunch of plate holders, a little tripod with it, and you could buy the kit and you could go around on your bicycle and, uh, and have a lot of fun with these in an amateur market because you didn't have to mess with the wet plates. Eventually, George improved the process to where the dry plates became more sensitive, but one of his employees developed this photosensitive material onto roll film. Now you've got the brownie camera comes into play, you press the button, and we do the rest. And George made a killing. And you could, um, the, all the pictures were round, and they mount them. There was a variety of different materials that were used for the prints, but they would always mount them. And the original camera, I believe, was $25. Original camera cost $25. Processing and printing and new film cost $10. And you had a hundred exposures on a 50-foot roll of film. Eventually, they went to a 50-foot roll of film. Um, I'm sorry, a 25-foot roll of film, which had been 50 exposures, because people didn't want to wait 100 exposures before they get their prints back. Now we started entering the amateur market, and now you had you could just buy the camera if you could afford it. Uh, this one, I think, yeah, shutter's still working. It had uh, one shutter speed. That's it. I think some of them, I, this might have a, yeah, this has a way, this one has a little button here, and that, that I can lock the shutter open on this one. And it had a couple different choices for your app. Well, this one looks like it only has two. Some, some have this little thing at the top which controls your aperture, it's either full sun or cloudy. So you had very limited control. And that's, uh, you also had a limited control here. It had another lens uh, inside, another uh, lens element inside. If you're doing a close-up from five to 10 feet, you do that, take the exposure, and when you go back to doing your normal exposures beyond 10 feet, you go to there. So they had some variation of being able to focus it a little bit. But so many of these pictures are out of focus. When, when was that available? When was that marketed? Um, George, uh, 1890s. Let me see. What was the exact date on here? Do I have it on here? Um, typically, yeah, 1890 thereabouts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
I was really hoping the one of the little of the young lady holding what looks like a daguerreotype. It's like really, maybe she's holding this one. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, no. It's uh, I took my loop out. It's a guy. She's holding it. Um, but uh, it's it's a very nice image. And then remember how I, I showed you how to take those out of the case. I took the other one out of the case, and so I want to introduce you to Miss Betsy Barlow. And Betsy Barlow um, was born in 1784 in Dutchess County, which I believe is in New York. And these three things fell out of the back. Okay, We had a lock of her hair, we had her obituary, and we had a letter written by her pastor, Rochester, New York, November 11th, 1849. That's where George Eastman was doing his thing, in Rochester. Okay, and where Mother Xerox ended up being, but let's not go there. Um, what did he write? Uh, the bearer, Miss Betsy Barlow, this was Rochester, November 11th, 1849. The bearer, Miss Betsy Barlow, is a beloved member of the Second Baptist Church of this city. As she expects to be absent a few months, she is hereby... Commended to all sister churches and to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, signed, I think it's Henry Davis, pastor. But she was born in 1784. She lived to be 100 years, 2 months, and 22 days. She was born when the framers of the Constitution were still around. She lived during the Spanish-American War, through the Civil War. She died, I, I found her, I, I, I like telling people she was born in the... 18th century. She lived in the 19th century. I found her in the 20th century. She's now part of the 21st century. So she's lived four centuries. And when she died, uh, she was the mother of eight children, of which three are living, which means five died. But yeah, that's a whole different set. Okay. And somebody has suggested, oh, why didn't you have her um, genetically tested? Well, I don't think there's any roots to the hair. That's, that's one problem. But uh, remember, this was somebody's family history that I found in the bottom of a shoebox. Wow. Everything you've seen today, none of it's mine. I don't have this stuff from our family. The only thing I have that I know was a what's called a crayon photograph, oval frame, bubble glass. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty rough. Those are called crayon photographs. They got not in the Crayola sense that we think of a crayon, but it was pastels, charcoals, very rough form of making enlargements. It was an early form of making those enlargements. And that's why it looks pretty, pretty rough. But you can see there's some detail in there that does give you the fundamental of a photograph. So I wanted to make sure that I introduced her before we, we cut. Uh, yeah. Rebecca's kicking me out. Oops, wait. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see like a viewer on those cameras. How did they? Uh, those actually they had a they had a thing called a ground glass on the back, and they that's when you have the. The little hood thing, you see people oh, doing that? Okay. Right, I still have one of those cameras. And there's ground glass. And when you're looking at it, everything on that ground glass is upside down and backwards. Yeah. And after a while, that looks normal. <laughs> I mean, it sounds strange. But, and when I'm photographing, I also see it in black and white. I have very good color perception. Um, but I see what I'm seeing on the ground glass. I'm seeing it as black and white. Because that's, that's what I still do. I still do black and white film. Yeah, okay. So anyway, thank you guys. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you've got any questions, I've we'll, we got to pack up real quick, and then we'll move to the back. Right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, and, and thank you for...